Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Calvin, for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me here. I, this is my first time in Singapore, um, second time in Asia, but it's been, it's been a long time since uh, I think the last time I was in Asia was in 2005. So it's been a very long time. I'm excited to, already excited to come back. Um, so I guess this talk is a little bit high level. I, I will have some examples and uh, some things about pandas, but also I, I wanted to comment a bit generally about you know, the state of Python for working with data. And you know, if you're not very familiar with some of the development that's been going on the last five or six years, just to tell you a bit about that, and at least to tell you from, from my point of view, um, you know, what are the interesting trends right now and where, where I see things where I see things going. Um, so I've been, I've been doing a lot of things the last few years. Um, most recently, I just moved to San Francisco from, from New York. Um, I'm working on a new analytics company there, uh, which is not, hasn't, hasn't launched yet, and uh, there will be more information about that uh, later this year. Um, went to MIT a long time ago, uh, started the Pandas project not long after I got out of college, mainly because I was very excited about programming in Python. Um, but I found that there was kind of a missing, um, there was a missing piece, which was uh, data manipulation tools. Um, you had great general purpose programming libraries, tools for building systems, unit testing libraries, um, array computing with NumPy, uh, very rich uh, scientific Python ecosystem, um, but the statistical data, data analysis tools and data manipulation, data cleaning tools, um, there really wasn't very much of that in Python, in large part because Python didn't have a very big statistics community. Uh, so I started, um, started Pandas essentially in response to, uh, in response to that. Um, so my book came out in October, and, and the, goal, uh, the goal of the book was to, to have a nice introduction for people who've never... Um, never used Python for working with data before. So it's not a book about data analysis methods so much as it is a book that shows you how to use um, the important Python tools for, for working with data so that you can do data analysis. Um, so I wanted to give a nice introduction to um, the main scientific Python tools, NumPy for array computing, IPython, which is the programming environment um, we've all come, you know, I've you know, been a big fan of. Uh, matplotlib for data visualization, and then pandas is about you know maybe more than half the book, um, showing you how to use the library to solve um, you know all of the the various problems you may encounter. So the the last six years have been very interesting for 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 Python. Um, well, you, you know you have to remember that NumPy, which is the array computing library for Python, essentially what gives you you know matrices and linear algebra. Um, and you know, MATLAB-like functionality in Python really only existed in its current form um, from about 2005 onward. Um, there were multiple array libraries starting in about 1995, and there was a bit of a community fragmentation that was going on, and Travis Oliphant um, really wanted to unite the Python community under a single array library and, and merge those two libraries together, numeric and numarray, and create a NumPy, and that was only in 2005. Um, and the NumPy project in SciPy, which is built on top of NumPy, has matured a lot uh, in the last five years, and that's been very important for businesses who, who want to adopt Python and want to feel like they're building on top of a mature and stable tool, that the code that they write, um, they write today is, is going to be robust and not have weird crashes and problems running in production, but that that code will also be maintainable and will still have a good chance of, of working a few years down the road. Um, one of the other really game-changing things in, in the Python ecosystem the last, uh, really just last two years, has been the IPython notebook. Um, how many of you have used the IPython notebook? So I'll, sh I'll show it to you in, in the talk. Um, but it's been a really great um, tool for creating and sharing um, data analysis and really any kind of Python work. Um, it's very easy to take a, a notebook that you've created on your computer and um, Upload it on the internet and share it with people. It's a really great way to uh, great way to collaborate on uh, on Python work. Um, other libraries that have been really important for bringing more people into Python ecosystem um, outside of Pandas have been things like Scikit-Learn for machine learning. Uh, so it used to be if you wanted to do uh, machine learning, you had to you had to use R or you had to use you know Java or some other um, some other library. So a group of primarily um, 
primary, prim they seem to be mostly French, but mostly uh, you know, French and German uh, developers have built the Scikit-Learn library and now has a very large and very active uh, community of developers. Um, so if you go on GitHub and look at the Scikit-Learn project, it's kind of a, a model for how open source should work. Um, you know, the, the progress they've made is really incredible. I've been involved in Stats Models, which is the statistics and econometrics library for, uh, for Python. It gives, gives you a lot of the kinds of um, regression and statistics tools that you have in, in R, but in Python. Um, there's now, we, we now even have formulas. So if you, it used to be pretty hard to write down uh, complex regression models, so now you can write down um, if, you, if you're familiar with R, you can write formula strings that describe your linear model, um, and th there's a formula parser that, will, that, will, that connects with stats models that you can use. Other things, well, the next talk up is about PyCUDA, which has certainly brought a lot of people um, to Python for doing high-performance computing. Um, tools like PyCUDA and PyOpenCL make um, gra you know, programming on GPUs um, for very high-performance um, computing applications a lot more accessible. So if you've ever writ written CUDA code in C and gone through that, that painful process and then gone to PyCUDA, it's, you know, uh, it's just really a, a transformative process. So I, I wrote some CUDA C before I used PyCUDA, and I was really upset about all the time I spent writing C code uh, before I used PyCUDA, so really great. Um, another missing piece of the puzzle, is that, as I was saying, is, is Pandas, which um, made Python a good language for um, working with any kind of raw data and, and wrangling it into shape so that you can do analysis on it. Um, so data preparation, I love this, I love this quote. This, this uh, happened during the Strata conference uh, last February in, uh, in the Bay Area, um, that in doing data analysis, often the data cleaning and data preparation makes up a lot of, a lot of the time that you spend doing the analysis. Um, you know, people quote 80%, sometimes it could be 90%. Um, and you spend a lot of time, you know, you, you prepare your data, you do a bit of analysis, and you might find some problem with your data, and you have to return to the sort of data cleaning, data preparation um, to sort out issues and bad, you know, problems in your data. Um, so making the data cleaning and data preparation tools um, easier to use and more, more, you know, faster and more productive really overall speeds up the analysis process um, a great deal. Uh, and that's what Pandas is for. Um, it's a, it's a primarily a tabular, um, you know, spreadsheet style data manipulation tool for Python. Uh, it's very fast, so it's much faster than you would get writing something in pure Python. Um, but one of the main features is that it has a really nice API. So the functions, all of the, the methods and functions are intended to fit really nicely together so you don't have to spend, uh, hopefully you don't have to spend a lot of time digging around documentation and remembering how functions work. Um, so some people like to describe it as like R data frames in Python, and that's not a completely accurate characterization, but you know, you guess you can think of it, think of it that way. Um, and it's been growing very, very fast and now has a quite large development community. Um, as an aside, another project I've been involved with is a, a little library called vBench. So if you ever care about performance testing your code and are interested in you know, keeping track of how fast your code is, um, it's a tool, I had to build it in order you know, to keep myself sane while developing Pandas, um, monitoring whether things uh, get slow or not. So you can see in this uh, example, um, you know, in the middle of 2011, there was an operation that got slower for a while and then it got faster and faster over, the t over time. Um, so this is a benchmark of a simple Pandas statement um, benchmarked at each, um, each version of the code base over time. So you can see how you know, keep track of whether the library is getting slower or faster. So w one of the big things that I've learned in, in working on data tools is if your tools are hard to work with, um, you're less creative. And I, f I found this myself that, because um, I'm very curious, like I like to ask a lot of questions and um, I like to be able to get answers to those questions very quickly. So each time you ask a question, if you feel like you have to go through um, a lot of you know, pain and suffering to be able to, to get to the point where you can answer that question, sometimes you may not even do it at all. So the, so the less impedance and the less friction um, you, you have in your, in your tools, um, the faster you can, you can sort of iterate and ask different questions and analyze your data. Um, and this will you know, hopefully lead to you know, more cre creative work and better, better insights into your data. 
So one, uh, one interesting analysis, how many of you use the Stack Overflow website? Most people, yeah. Uh, so Stack Overflow has gotten much more popular over the last, the last few years, and I think primarily because people find that they can get answers to their questions really quickly, sometimes in, in minutes. Um, you know, the number of people who are actively trolling Stack Overflow and you know, answering questions is, is pretty remarkable. People have an incredible amount of time on, time on their hands. So I was interested in, in looking at, um, you, can query, you can query all the data from Stack Overflow and uh, about any particular topic. So you, I downloaded all of the Python um, Stack Overflow data for the last, um, since the beginning of 2009. And I was interested in looking at, just based on Stack Overflow, what can we see about what's going on in Python and, you know, in the whole world. So, so let's do that. So I'm inside the, inside the IPython notebook. So if no one has ever seen this thing before, I'll give you a very brief, uh, very brief teaser about it. So the idea with the, uh, if, if any of you have ever used Mathematica, this will be very familiar. I think it was modeled on the uh, Mathematica notebook. And the idea is to be able to have code cells that you can put, um, you can put Python, Python code in. Um, so if I put print hello world, I'm using Python 2, so I don't need parentheses. Um, if I put print hello world, what's going on is I'm inside Google Chrome, so I'm in a web browser, and the uh, notebook application is running on my local machine, and I can put a Python statement here, press shift enter. It sends that code to a running IPython process, executes it. If, um, if there's any output, um, if there's any output or plots or anything, it captures, captures those and in, inserts them in the browser. So if I had, um, so if I generate some random data with NumPy, so I just generated some 1,000 ra normally distributed random numbers, took the cumulative sum to turn it into a random walk, and then I'm using the matplotlib plot function um, to make a plot. And so to have this, this notebook interface is really nice because you can, um, you can essentially tell a story um, with your Python code. Um, you can also have cells that have um, markdown. So I can put stack overflow analysis here. And so I can put any, any markdown statements here. Um, so you can, you can mix, um, expo you can mix uh, uh, text and, and writing with your code and analysis and build, um, you know, people are starting to use the notebook to write books and papers and, you know, blog and do all kinds of things. So it's a very, very nice uh, tool ecosystem. So what I did, um, I'm not going to take you deeply through the code, but I, um, so I downloaded all of the Stack Overflow data into one big, one big pandas data frame. And so if we look at the, look at the tags column in the data frame, you can see um, that each, each, um, each post, I'll show you what a post looks like, if I can. OK. So a post looks like this. So you have a post ID, the date it was created, um, the, person who, the person who asked the question, um, and its, its title, and also its tags. And so we're really interested. Um, in these tags, and that's kind of a, a proxy for what the, what the question is about. Um, so this guy asked about um, calculating harmonic series, so it's tagged with math and, and, and Python. So we, let's look at... So what we want to do is to, to take all of these tags and to do some, some aggregate the data to get some kind of idea about um, which tags appear the most over time, and then maybe we can look at some trends and see how things are, um, how, you know, what people are talking about on Stack Overflow is changing over time. Um, so I won't, I won't belabor you, but I, I wrote a little regular expression to split um, tags into a list of, list of strings. So it made a, uh, a big table called tag table. 
that now has for each post ID uh, a sub tag associated with it. Then I can merge that with the, the post table. So now if we look at this merged table, So now we have, um, for each post ID and each sub tag, in each sub tag, we have one row in the table. So now this is something that we can, um, that we can aggregate. So now I'm going to take this merge table, group by sub tag, call the size method, and that gives us the count of number of posts by, um, number of posts by tag order in descending order, and then take the top 500. So make this a little bigger. Gosh. OK. So this is since the beginning of 2009. These are the top, um, the top occurring tags on Stack Overflow for the whole, uh, for the whole time span. So as, as you might expect, well, everything's tagged with Python, so that's everything. But then, you know, Django being definitely the most popular Python library is next up. Um, you know, Google App Engine, NumPy is also up there. Kind of shows you, you know, relative to Django, you know, how, roughly how popular, you know, scientific Python is relative to web development. You know, regular expressions, matplotlib, um, various things on down here. If we look at the top, top 25, I think I have to go a bit further down the list to find pandas. I think pandas is in the top 50. Yeah, so, so pandas is down here toward the end, of the, uh, the end of the top 40. And so this isn't that interesting because this is just, well, it is interesting, but it, um, it's over the entire, the entire sample of the data set. So if we want to look at trends over time, what we can do, uh, first I need to convert the, the creation date column, which is strings, into timestamps. So I do that. And then I'm going to filter down the data set to just the top 500 tags, just to make things a little faster. Um, and then I'm going to group by tag. And for each, for each sub tag, I want to get a count by month. So for you know, September 2009, for each tag, we would get, a, um, get the number of posts that occurred in, in that month. So this is pretty, pretty standard Panda stuff. Show you what this thing looks like. OK, so we have a, we have a big data frame now, um, one column per tag. The index, which are the row labels of the data frame, are timestamps. So going from um, January 2009 through June 2013. If we look at the Python tag and then plot that, so that's, this shows us um, the number of posts per month over the full sample. So you can see, um, well, Python is getting more popular, but Stack Overflow is also getting more popular. Um, and then there's this drop at the end, and that's because we're, we're in, in, a partial, in a partial month. So I'm going to drop off, just go up to 2013, 531 to so drop off the June data. So now we don't have that, uh, that partial month at the end. And now there's a, there's a few interesting trends in the data set, um, particularly in, you know, between libraries that do similar things. So you can see how you know, the popularity of things has changed over time. Um, and one thing that we want to do is, because you see that Python questions are getting more popular on Stack Overflow, so we might be interested in, to see you know, what percentage of um, Python posts are about Django over time, rather than looking at the absolute number. Um, because we're going to see an uptrend basically in everything, you know, just based on this overall, overall trend. So I'm going to divide everything by the pi number of Python posts. That gives us a percentage. And so here you can see this is just the, the percentage for, uh, for Pandas. So you can see the library, you know, taking off. And now, you know, a little over 2% of Stack Overflow questions um, recently, in recent times on, on, are about Python or also about Pandas. Um, we can also look at Django and see that 
you know, back in 2010, you know, almost 15% of questions were about Django, and then you see Django becoming, well, at least less popular based on this metric um, over time. Something like Flask, which has been gaining in popularity, um, you can see, well, it's really only about, you know, percent and a half, but, you know, getting quite a lot more popular. Google App Engine, um, which is Google's uh, sort of web development hosting platform. Um, Python 3. If anyone's using Python 3, you can see um, generally uh, people not being as excited about Python 3 a few years ago, and more and more people are, are adopting it. Uh, Matplotlib. Matplotlib also getting more popular over time. Um, regular expressions staying about the same. I think people generally have problems with regular expressions all the time. Uh, I know I do. Another thing is maybe like Iron Python. So I think a few years ago, people were more excited about doing Python on .NET. And there was a lot more activity around Iron Python, and, but it's, it's sort of de declining, and declining in popularity. And then there's other like, things like Twisted. I don't know if any of you use Twisted for asynchronous uh, uh, event stuff or use Tornado for, for doing web, web stuff. So you can look at you know, the popularity of Twisted over time. You know, had a very more popular period and has become less popular. And Tornado, which is a new library, you can see appeared in you know, late 2009 and has gotten, gotten a bit more, more popular over time, but still less than um, a percent of questions. So this is fairly interesting. Um, so one thing we might want to do is to look at, you know, let's, and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble by uh, trying to do this on the fly, but we might want to look at you know, trending, um, trending tags, like things that have experienced the most growth over um, you know, over the last year, either growth or decline, you know, to see kind of what's, what's moving and shaking in, in Python land. So I'm going to go back to my, my data aggregation, and rather than um, resampling by month, I'm going to go by, go by year. Of course, that doesn't want to work. Oh, great. Let's try A. Okay. So... Now we have data um, annually. So now you can see this is, um, so we'll just look at this graphically, make a bar plot of Python posts. So here we're looking at, this is a, this is a, a partial, um, this is a partial year, um, but we can, Let's just look at Django, and now I need to do I need to do that normalization thing again, just so we can look at percentages. I'm going to post this notebook online, so you can feel free to, to have at the data yourself. See what you can find. So if we look at norms Django, so here is the. Um, the, the Django plot over time is 2013, 2012. And if we take just this time series, there is a method percent change, which gives us um, the year over year change um, on a relative basis for each year. And so what we want to do is do this for um, do this for every for every tag, and then find like the top ten and the bottom ten to see what's what's changing. So, so I'm just going to do that. So we're going to call percent change on the entire on the entire data frame. I'm selecting the percent changes for 2013. So uh, so what's let's call this what's happening 2013. Order by value. Ooh, this doesn't look. This doesn't look good. Well, this isn't that. This will. These might be a bit distorted, but uh, because uh, we we don't we don't have the counts here, so we might want to. Well, these are the top 500, so it's should be fairly accurate data. So let's uh, let's get the downtrends and then the uptrends. Okay.
Yeah, so here's the uptrends. So this is maybe some things you might expect. Um, in particular, you know, Raspberry Pi has gotten super popular. How many of you own a Raspberry Pi? Very cool. Um, you know, Python 3 getting more popular. Um, Pandas getting more popular. SymPy, which is also another important library in um, doing numerical and symbolic computing in Python. Um, Scikit-learn. We can see you know, Flask and uh, Node.js also getting a lot more popular, people using Python in, in, a, web, in a web system. Um, IPython getting quite a lot more popular. And in the, in the downtrends, I don't know if there's anything. Um, it would also be interesting to look at the counts here to see how many posts, posts overall there were. Um, there was a real, uh, so meta, meta classes and meta programming, I don't know if you noticed, there was a big, people were t just couldn't stop talking about meta classes for a couple of years there. Um, so when I started to look at this data, somebody said, oh, you should look at you know, how, how much people are talking about meta classes. And so you can see that you know, year over year, you know, down 50%. So people are getting less and less excited about you know, really crazy meta programming. Um, the number of Emacs questions down 40%. So people are not big, big Emacs fans anymore. Um, uh, let's see. I mean, down 20%. So just people aren't asking about text editors, you know. Uh, maybe like sublime text is in here. Sublime text too. All right, plus thirty-seven percent. How many of you use Sublime text too? I don't, but it's a very great, great text editor. All right, so, so as you can see, there are some things changing, happening in, in the uh, in the Python community. Um, there are, I guess, more general, like broader trends in technology that we can um, that we can talk more about, and uh, I just wanted to comment on a few of them. Um, so generally, you know, with the growth of, you know, with web technologies getting better, web browsers getting better, um, there's more and more of a push to, to putting things um, in browser-based interfaces, things like the IPython notebook, um, putting the computation in the cloud rather than on your local desktop, um, you know, essentially being able to do computing anywhere, you know, um, now that there's like the Chromebook, being able to essentially have, you know, a, uh, have a, a computer just be a view on some, uh, you know, um, some remote uh, computation in the cloud and so not have to, uh, to do anything locally anymore. And, you know, you can imagine how this would be beneficial. I'm sure you've all experienced headaches with, you know, uh, deploying, you know, installing software on your computer and, you know, sort of, um, you could sort of, you know, solve that problem by having everything be, be handled, um, sort of handled by somebody else in the cloud and not have to, you know, set up your own machines, sort of, you know, I've suffered a lot from that myself. Um, one of the things that's also pushed people to do more data stuff in, on the web and in the cloud is that uh, web graphics has gotten a lot better. So um, I don't know how many of you do JavaScript. Uh, anyone use D3 in here? So, uh, well, I'll show you a couple D3 examples. But um, so, so generally, you know, th three or four years ago, um, it was much harder to do um, a lot of interactive visualization on the web just because, you know, there was Internet Explorer, and so you'd write JavaScript code, and it would work in one browser, not in another. Um, so with um, more and more, uh, you know, the browser source, you know, the, the web technology becoming more standardized, you can have more confidence that you can build something once, and then it will run, run everywhere. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, like Calvin was saying, about big data. Uh, people are also starting to talk about whether big data is over uh, overhyped, which I think is probably true. But big data is still uh, an important trend and one worth paying attention to. Um, I guess the other thing I'll talk about very briefly is sort of um, just-in-time compilers. You know, making Python faster, making languages faster, um, generally speeding up uh, computation. And I would say that the big challenge for for Python over the next four or five years, especially with the big push toward, toward the web and, and toward the cloud, is, is how for, keep, to keep Python as an important and relevant language that people want to program in and that they can, that they can use to, to build 
uh, systems in the way that they need to be built um, for the future. Um, I don't know that I know the best answer to this. Um, I have some ideas, but uh, I think this is going to be something that we all have to, to pay a lot, of, a lot of attention to. Uh, you know, hopefully we're not all, you know, we don't have to give up on Python and just program in JavaScript, because um, that would make us all very sad. So, but there is something very alluring about being able to do all of your data analysis on the web. Um, you know, to be able to build something in one place, share that with anybody, um, access your data and your analysis, and to be able to, you know, uh, ask, quest ask and answer questions very quickly, you know, from any computer, um, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, sites like Bitbucket and GitHub and, you know, nice sites for software development have really revolutionized uh, collaboration on software projects. Um, I'm very hopeful that the same thing will happen for, for data analysis. There's really not that not that kind of thing. It's still very much, you know, here's my code on GitHub and maybe a link to the data and you can reproduce the analysis in that way. Um, so I'm very interested in this problem. One of the, pro uh, one of the big issues is that um, implementing all of the, the data processing in JavaScript uh, is a pretty tall order. Uh, I've written quite a bit of, of analytics code in JavaScript and it's really just, JavaScript is not meant for that. Um, the other problem is that you're not going to, to process all of the data um, in the browser. So, you know, whenever you're working inside a web browser, you have to only be looking at small subsets of the data. And so that really complicates your, your system. You have to do data processing on the server side um, and be interacting with only a small subset, you know, for visualization or sort of, you know. But on the other hand, your brain can only look at so much data at once. So. Um, it doesn't even, you know, even if you had a whole giant pile of data in the browser, you know, you, you wouldn't need all of it in there at once. Um, the other problem, of course, is building interactive applications. You get very used to having a desktop application. You press enter, the code runs, the, the results happen immediately or as soon as they, they run on your, your laptop or your, your desktop. Um, but when you're on the web, you have to think about, you know, server round trip time and cloud storage and how data moves between machines and it just, it, becomes a lot more, a lot more complicated. Um, so, of course, web, web graphics has just uh, really had a, had a renaissance or, well, there really never was a birth before, so it's had a, it's had a uh, just, you know, really had a fantastic growth of um, really nice and compelling visualizations on the web. Um, the main technologies that are driving that are, are SVG and, and Canvas. Um, the big SVG library that everyone uses um, it's a vector graphics um, library for JavaScript. It's called D3. It stands for Data Driven Documents uh, by the venerable Mike, Mike Bostock. Um, let's see if I have, I do have a couple of examples here that I'll jump to in a second. Uh, so with regard to, to JavaScript, um, I think in order for, for Python to really stay relevant, you know, rather than saying, no, I'm not going to program in JavaScript, you know, I think you know, we have to sort of, you know, we, we have to build interfaces to, to JavaScript and to the web technology so that you can keep your um, you know, serious work in Python, but then whenever you need to build a visualization or you need to send that, those results of some, something that's happening in Python to the web, um, that you have a nice way to do that and that you can enable other people um, to get their their data and analysis um, on the web. And there's been some really great examples of this. So, you know, what I've already showed you, the IPython notebook is um, essentially, it's a big, you know, runs in the web browser, it's a big uh, JavaScript application. And now when you look at the IPython project, it's become, you know, not 50%, but it's a, a lot of the code in IPython now is in JavaScript, which is not something I think the IPython guys would have, would have predicted um, a few years ago. Another great example is the, um, the RStudio IDE. Um, any RStudio or R users in the room? All right. So, um, so RStudio is, it's been around for about three years and maybe four years now, um, but it's, uh, it's an IDE for, for R programming. Um, and so it's got, you know, graphics and a, and a shell down here. So that's uh, R code, so graphics and all this. Um, but the really amazing thing about, about this application is that even though it's running on my Mac in a, and looks like just like a, a normal, uh, normal application, 
the, the folks who build it, JJ Allaire and, and, and uh, Joe Chang and others, they, they build it entirely using web technologies. So this exact same application could be run inside the web browser, um, but users of it would never know that they're looking at a web application. So it's, it's pretty brilliant, and I think it's, it's a model for, for the future um, of being able to have applications that can run either locally on the desktop or can run in the, inside the web browser in the cloud. Um, and to just not know the difference. So you, could have a, you don't have to make a choice of whether you're going to be in the browser, in the cloud, or, um, or local on the desktop. Um, another thing that can, um, that can really help is, is building integrations between libraries like Pandas, like data, data and analysis tools, and charting libraries like, um, well, I'll show you a couple of examples here. There's a fellow in Portland named Rob Story who's got, um, got some libraries for Integrating pandas with um, integrating pandas with uh, um, JavaScript libraries. So here's here's one example using um, the library Vega.js, which is a pretty new package, and um, you know make, making a bar chart. Uh, I think I don't know if this uses pandas data, but no, this is just using vanilla sort of raw Python data. Um, but this chart is not generated by Matplotlib, it's rendered in the browser, and this is uh, vector graphics, and here's, a, here's, an area, here's an area plot, and here's a line plot. Um, and I think this is you know, generally a, a good idea, when, especially when you have things like the IPython notebook, which you run in the browser, makes it a lot easier to incorporate um, the cutting edge developments in, um, in JavaScript land. Here's another example also by, uh, by Rob Story from the, uh, he has another project called Folium, which is as soon as this loads, and it uh, it integrates pandas with um, a library called Leaflet.js, which is a mapping mapping library. So this is um, some data about the um, about the U.S. that's being overlaid on a on a map, and the legend up here. And so I can zoom in on this, and um, well, it doesn't give me tooltips. But uh, so this is you know Java interactive JavaScript visualization that's being fed directly by by data from from pandas. Um, there's other libraries like uh, like Chart ChartKick. So this is a it's actually a Ruby library. There's a there's a Python one now, um, and the idea is to have um, very simple um, very simple Ruby or Python code that that makes it easy to take data in those languages and build interactive. Um, JavaScript visualizations, and so you know each of these charts. You know one line of Ruby. There's also the equivalent Python interface that gives you the same thing uh, with one line of Python. So if you need to get um, graphics in the in the browser and you want to use Python, these are good options to consider. So I think a lot about you know generally you know, what what makes the the, the perfect um, data language and you know as much as I love Python uh, I'm not completely convinced that Python is it but it's pretty good and it's I think it's gone quite far and and everyone you know I'm, I've been very happy you know using pandas and people um, so you know so 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 seem to be a lot of other people um, but I think there's still work to do and you know. Some of the problems have to do with like low-level concerns, you know, things like missing data, so like designing all of the data structures with missing data in mind. Um, you know, you want to spend most of your the, your brain cycles thinking about what you're doing with the data rather than how you're going to do it, um, and that often boils down to you know nice APIs and clean syntax. So one of the big problems with R is that the syntax and and the language itself often gets in your way. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do wanted to do Python um, way back when. But there's even things that are a bit hard to to express in Python. Um, and using SQL is nice for certain kinds of data operations. But yet there's a lot of things where um, you know writing you know SQL sort of SQL queries is not a particularly you know good way to express what you want. So we, I think we haven't we haven't quite got there yet. Um, but I think a lot of what you need the the core you know, built-in operations of grouping and sorting, um, you know, doing set logic and filtering and all of that. Um, all of that needs to be there and needs to be fast and really easy to use. 
So another important trend, especially on um, you know, where the computation is happening, is more and more projects are being built on top of um, just-in-time compiler technology. So if, you, if you're not familiar with what a just-in-time compiler is, the idea is that um, you have a, a framework that can take a high-level description of an algorithm and generate fast, um, fast machine code, uh, assembly code on the fly. Uh, so that it sort of steps around the traditional, um, you know, if you wrote C code, you would write that C code, compile it, and then, and then run it. Um, but you, if you need to generate a custom function on the fly that's, that's optimized for a particular specific application, it's often, you know, you wouldn't want to generate all of those, you know, uh, you could end up with, you know, millions of combinations of specialized functions um, that you might want to compile. Um, so having a, a tool chain like LLVM enables you to build custom functions and then generate very, very fast code that's every bit as fast as if you wrote hand-coded uh, C code. And one of the really great things about, um, about these tools is that you can, um, you can write, you know, there's a tool called Num Numba, which came out in the last uh, you know, two years, I think last year, really. And it enables you to write Python code. And then the Numba tool chain uses LLVM to translate that Python code into, um, into machine code. And so essentially, it's you know, about as fast as if you wrote C code. Sometimes it's faster. Um, there's another language called Julia, which is a new uh, scientific programming language. And it's built entirely on top of um, everything you write in the language gets passed through um, the LLVM um, compiler tool chain. So all of the code is compiled um, on the fly and is very, very fast as a result. Um, some of you are probably familiar with PyPy, which, is, um, which is, it has its own uh, just-in-time compiler tool chain. And that team has really done some amazing work, um, you know, squeezing performance out of Python, you know, doing optimizations that people never thought were, never thought were possible. Um, there's other projects. Uh, I, I put up here a, a project from uh, Cloudera, which is a big, big data company um, in the Bay Area. And they built a project called Impala, which is um, basically a database engine or a SQL and SQL engine on top of Hadoop. Um, and part of where it gets its speed is by using LLVM to take SQL queries and generate really fast, specialized um, functions that, that process the data. And I think that, that, th that sort of thing is going to be the model for the for the future. Um, now, in big data space, um, the big trend in the last two years is to do SQL everywhere. Uh, so I brought up SQL a couple of times. I was going to write up here on here SQL all the things. Um, but this is actually a pretty interesting um, set of benchmarks that came out. I don't know if any of you can read this, but there's, there's a lot of competing um, SQL interfaces to, to big data. So this was a set of benchmarks that was done comparing um, Hive, which is, um, was developed, Hive was developed at Facebook, and it um, basically takes a SQL query and converts it to a MapReduce job and runs it on Hadoop. Um, it works, but it's, uh, it wasn't built for performance, so it's pretty slow. So a lot of people have been building you know, replacements for Hive. Um, so this was done by the, uh, the Spark team from, from Berkeley, and they have a project called Shark, which is Hive on Spark. Um, and they were comparing that with Impala, and also Redshift, which is a big data SQL engine um, that came out about six months ago, well, within the last year from Amazon that runs on Amazon Web Services. Um, so basically, in big data land, there's a big uh, shootout going on to who can build the fastest uh, SQL engine for big data. Um, and so it's very interesting to pay attention to. And a lot of it's just doing pretty simple you know, group by aggregations. Um, but it turns out that that's a, that represents a, a, lot of, a lot of business use cases. So basic conclusions uh, that I have for you know, data tools and you know, where things, things are going, um, you know, I think we all, you know, we all have to embrace the web. It's where, you know, where things are going, the web and, and the cloud. Um, you know, the desktop model of, uh, model of computing is, is really on its way down. Um, you know, in the future, it's going to be, you know, tablets and your phone and, well, I guess, you know, the tablets are shrinking in size, the phones are increasing in size, so I guess at some point we'll just have one device that we occasionally, you know, hold up here and sometimes we type, you know. Um, so device consolidation, um, you know, the user interfaces, and I think those need to get worked on, of course, you know, it's like, how do you build a, a data analysis interface for touch? 
I, I don't know that I, I really know the answer to that. Um, productivity with, with data tools, uh, there's still a lot more work to do. Um, I think you know, tools like Pandas are a good step in the right direction and I think have made people a lot uh, more capable and productive in working with their data. Um, but it's, it's definitely worth examining, like, especially when you're working with data yourself and you run into something that is tedious or takes you a long time or you, know, you can't figure out how to do something, you know, write that down and you know, tell people about it and open an issue on GitHub or write, write an email to the mailing list uh, to tell people you know, the problem that you ran into and tell them about your use case um, and what you see as kind of roadblocks or problems with the tools um, for, for your particular problem. Um, and I think that the more that you know, the, you know, the open source development community understands you know, problems that people are experiencing in the real world, that really helps, um, helps everyone make you know, good, uh, you know, good design decisions and you know, new thinking about, about the tools and how to make them, them better. Um, and of course, um, you know, I think big data is, is here to stay. Uh, the Python, Python ecosystem is definitely good for medium data. Um, Py Python really hasn't um, had mainstream success in, in big data. Um, so if we go back to you know, this, this benchmark page, um, the same project uh, that the, the team that, that made these benchmarks of, of for Shark um, for the Spark project, there's now a Python interface to Spark, so you can, you can write uh, functions in Python that, that, proce that process big data. Um, so the, to the extent that you know, we can build bridges to the, to the um, big data ecosystem so that we can get more people programming Python and processing big data with it, uh, I think that will also help you know, Python stay relevant because you know, the data is not shrinking in size. Um, you know, maybe, we'll, may, maybe in two or three years we'll all decide that you know, all this data that we, you know, petabytes of data that we're warehousing isn't really worth much and we should just start throwing it all away. Um, so, yeah, that's my, that's my talk. I, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me here and I'll have some time for some, some questions, which, uh, you know, ha happy to comment on, uh, further on any of these, these topics. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, could I have the could I have the mic? Yeah. Thanks for the talk, Wes. Uh, I think it's a very good article from from us in New York for finance last month. Can you tell me what is the update in the finance area? So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, um we attended the party conference in New York for finance. So uh, can you have an update on the especially area of finance, you know, the use of finance? Yeah, so the question is um, how, um, you know, how the use of Python finance is uh, changing or doing generally. Um, so Python has become really, really popular in finance uh, in, in short. Um, when I started using Python in 2007, uh, people thought I was crazy. They were like, this is not a serious language. You can't build production systems with this. The only real choices are Java and C++. Um, so now everyone is you know, hiring Python developers as fast as they can for doing financial work. Um, and I think that organizations have seen you know, the productivity benefits um, both in sort of their system maintainability, developer happiness, um, and being able to get you know, more, more done with uh, fewer people. Um, and also, you know, because the libraries have gotten a lot better, um, people are you know, big uh, financial firms, um, even like big investment banks. JP Morgan has, you know, I don't know if any of you work for JP Morgan, but they're big, big Python users, Bank of America. Um, you know, you, I, I know folks at you know, UBS and uh, you know, Goldman Sachs and you know, really all the banks that are, they're, you know, people really taken to, um, take to Python. Scala, Scala, which is a Java, Java uh, JVM language, has gotten a lot more popular in finance as well. So I think the two big trends there are in Python and Scala in finance. So it's, it's uh, well, I'm, I'm not in finance anymore, but. You know, I'm excited to see Python uh, doing well there. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering whether you could go a bit into more detail about the collaborative effort. Like, um, right now, the, these tools, like I Python Notebook, and so on, they're very cool as, you know, as a single user kind of thing. And of course, everybody has their GitHub repository. But um, is there anything on the horizon that you can see where you can actually make um, collaborative like, work on this? 
Yeah, so my, uh, my friends over at uh, Continuum Analytics, um, they've built a hosted IPython notebook environment that um, I think there is a free, there's a free plan on here. So let's see, there's a free plan and then there's paid plans um, that hosts IPython notebooks and enables you to share and uh, share you know, notebooks among a group of, group of collaborators. Um, there's also, and they have a lot of other tools there for like environment management if you want to build like custom environments and all that kind of thing. Um, there's the NB Viewer um, site, which is a place to, you can upload a IPython notebook someplace, like on GIST, on GitHub, and then um, generate a link on NB Viewer and then send that out and so you can read, a, get a static view of an IPython notebook. So that also helps with collaboration. Um, there's no multi-user version of the IPython notebook. I know that the IPython team, well, they, um, they raised, a, they got a, a big grant to like a million dollar grant to work on IPython for the next two years. And uh, so they're pouring a lot of resources into improving the IPython infrastructure to be able to more easily integrate with, the, with JavaScript libraries and building like interactive widgets and things w within IPython. And I think they're also th um, hashing a plan for like a multi-user um, IPython notebook. Because what you really want is something that's kind of like Etherpad or any of those kind of collaborative text editors on the web. Um, and to be kind of both looking at an IPython notebook and working, collaborating on a, in real time on a project. I think within two years we'll have it, but I'm not sure exactly when. Why, why, is Py, why is Python getting more popular? Well, um, I don't have, I don't have com complete information about why Python is getting more popular, um, but I would say that the, the libraries have gotten better, so and both in the an analytics, like scikit-learn for machine learning, um, you know, stats models, uh, pandas for just general data work, I mean, that's brought a lot of people to the Python ecosystem. Um, sort of the web development libraries have gotten better, so more and more people are, well really I think like maybe Ruby has won in web development, like there's a lot more Ruby developers than Python developers, but generally there's a lot more people doing web development and building websites with, with Python. Um, there's also a lot of uh, refugees from Java and C++ that if, uh, maybe some of them in the room. Uh, I programmed in Java before I did Python, so. Um, I think uh, more, more companies are co becoming more comfortable building software in interpreted languages um, than they used to be. Like, people have embraced like, unit testing and like, dynamic types, and it used to, people used to be very a lot more uncomfortable with not having static types, and um, so more mainstream stream acceptance of dynamic languages has definitely made Python more popular. So, yeah, I think one of the main thing, things that's holding back um, a lot more MATLAB users from moving to Python is mainly the, the development environment. The people really love like the MATLAB IDE, the profiler, the debugger. Um, you know, the R community has been um, essentially solved that problem in a lot of ways with RStudio. And so I would be very interested to see, you know, the equivalent of RStudio in, in Python. I think that would help kind of really, you know, um, you know, drive the nail in the coffin on, on MATLAB a bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, you can, you can do, um, you know, pretty much all the things you can do in MATLAB in, in Python. Um, you know, some of the library is a bit rougher around the edges, but uh, I think the benefits that you get from, uh, you know, better data structures, 
you know, object-oriented programming, tools like, you know, tools like Pandas, which help with data preparation. Um, you know, I think they, they do bring a lot of benefits. So maybe if you want to sell, sell more people on switching away from MATLAB, like look at their code and find the places where they're kind of having to like really hack their way around limitations in MATLAB and show them a, show them a better way. And I think uh, once people realize that they can be, you know, by switching their technology, they can make themselves like more productive and, uh, you know, be able to get more done. Like they see, you know, okay, well, if I program in Python, then, you know, I can get more research done, you know, uh, you know, kind of the benefits become, yeah. Well, my real question is like, why there are so many pieces in Python? Like, oh, in Ruby, it's quite relevant. You think of uh, Ruby on real, right? The only, the only framework. But in Python, there are too many choices. Yeah, there's a yeah, there's a lot of frag there's a lot of fragmentation. Um, well, at least it's it's easier to it's easier to install now with things like you know um, Anaconda, which is like a free you know scientific Python distribution. So you know with a few clicks you can have everything installed. That used to be the big barrier. It's like oh I've got to install like 50 packages before I can like make a plot. So. That definitely is easier, but uh, the the library, you know, the multiple library problem. I don't. I guess I don't really have a good solution for that. I think, uh, you know, w with with pandas, what I've tried to do is to integrate multiple libraries and, and you know be able to access. If you want to make plots, you can make plots without knowing anything about matplotlib. You can do array computing without knowing deep deep information about NumPy. So that you know, you essentially have to learn one set of t integrated tools. And uh, you know, I don't know what, what problem domain you're in, but I think generally, you know, to build a, a set of you know um, domain-specific sort of tools and helper functions and utilities that help kind of you know reduce the amount of um, you know having to use you know eight different libraries to solve a problem. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a problem with open source. You know, you've got very highly distributed uh, development community rather than you know um, kind of the math works in Needham, Massachusetts. You know, building a tightly integrated development environment. I guess rather than asking for fewer libraries, I'd like to ask for one more, or actually about one more. You, you had some good examples of the web um, technologies that are sort of in the space of D3 yeah. and for JavaScript, and some of those um, things that, that basically create SVG um, canvas for, as alternatives to Matplotlib. So is there, I mean, when I was thinking, I was thinking, well, not Python, but wouldn't you want to just, wouldn't the ideal be to just overload everything in Matplotlib with something that generates SVG? I mean, is there, is there any movement towards that? So that, you mean, so that effectively, once you're in a web framework, you would be generating web graphics rather than the graphics that are, that are intended for the more traditional desktop user. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the question is, you know, why, you know, it, when you're in, you know, the IPython notebook and in the browser, like, why not do everything, you know, with web graphics and SVG? Uh, that's definitely the direction that we're going in. Um, I guess we're just not we're not there yet. It's like we need more developers and more people um, working on that problem. So you know, you saw here in, um, you know, I'm in R, and this is uh, made with ggplot2. And doing these kinds of you know faceted statistical graphics, you know, it's very easy to do in R, but doing this, you know, even with D3 is pretty pretty difficult. Um, but I think, you know, five years from now, we'll have a set of JavaScript libraries for gra for, st for statistical graphics that everyone uses, and we have interfaces to them from R, from Python, from JavaScript, um, and you know, all the graphics is going is clearly going to the web, and I think you know, generating static. Desktop graphics is, is a, going to be a thing of the past in the long term. Um, just it's uh, yeah, it's just a lot of development effort. I'm we're, you know my company we're working on a lot of things in that direction, and we'll definitely open source some packages that help with that at some point once they're ready for people to use. Um. I have uh, one more question. Don't mind. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a problem with Python and uh, the C Python implementation. Uh, so the question would be is, uh, how does that affect data processing? Yeah, so the um, concurrency, concurrency issues in, in Python, um, if you're doing data processing, 
Um, that can all be done, you know, in a multi-threaded way, you know, that you know releases the gill, and uh, um, you, that you just have to kind of design carefully for that. Like if you're using, a, if you're using, I, I'm a big fan of Cython for writing um, numerical codes, and uh, Cython has, um, you know, a version of range, p range, that will parallelize a for loop, and so as long as you're not accessing any Python data structures inside the loop, just doing numerical computing, then you can have truly multi-threaded code. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, well, if you're doing a, a lot of I/O stuff, then you know the gill is not really an issue because the I, you know the gill gets released. But there are occasionally um, things that you know that uh, where, where you know the gill does get in the way, and it is a long-term liability. So it's something I do worry about. Um, thank you, yeah, thank thank you very much. <laughs>